welcome. We're so excited to have you here with the wonderful Dr. John Gray of Men Are From Mars, Women Are From Venus fame. John's the star of the show today, so I'm going to be fielding the questions and asking those questions to John. And uh, thank you for all of you who have sent them in. And I want to give a really warm welcome to John, our special guest today. Thank you so much, John, for joining us. I'm really happy to be here. Thank you. Thank you so much. And John, I know for so many people here in my audience and um, throughout the world, so many people are familiar with you and your work. You're a household name so much for many of us and your work has benefited millions of people throughout the world. But I do like to give the official formal introduction before we jump right in. So John Gray is the author of the most well-known and trusted relationship book of all time, Men Are From Mars, Women Are From Venus. USA Today listed his book as one of the top 10 most influential books of the last quarter century. In hardcover, it was the number one best-selling book of the 1990s. Dr. Gray's books are translated into approximately 45 languages in more than 100 countries and continues to be a bestseller. Dr. Gray has written over 20 books. His most recent book is Beyond Mars and Venus. His Mars Venus book series has forever changed the way men and women view their relationships. John helps men and women better understand and respect their differences in both personal and professional relationships. His approach combines specific communication techniques with healthy nutritional choices that create the brain and the body chemistry for lasting health, happiness, and romance. His many books, blogs, and free online workshops at marsvenus.com provide practical insights to improve relationships at all stages of life and love. An advocate of health and optimal brain function, he also provides natural solutions for overcoming depression, anxiety, and stress to support increased energy, libido, hormonal balance, and better sleep. He has appeared repeatedly on Oprah, as well as on The Dr. Oz Show, Today, CBS This Morning, Good Morning America, and others. He has been profiled in Time, Forbes, USA Today, and People. He was also the subject of a three-hour special hosted by Barbara Walters. John Gray lives in Northern California, where he was married happily to his wife, Bonnie, for over 30 years, and they have three grown daughters and four grandchildren, and he is an avid follower of his own health and relationship advice. So welcome once again, John. So honored to have you here today. Thank you. It's a real pleasure to be with you. Thank you so much. So, John, you and I have spoken before, and I know that... Um, your comments today will be specifically to help and support women, mainly 40 and above, who are single and want to have a great relationship. And so there's so much interest in your work in my audience, and I asked some of the ladies to pre-submit questions, and I wonder if it would be okay if I ask some of those, and we'll start with kind of a broad question and then offer some more specific ones from there. Would that be all right? Uh, that would be great. Uh, great. All right. So, John, this question comes in from Christine. She says, thank you, thank you so much for this opportunity to hear more from John Gray. I have a question for Dr. Gray. What are some tips for women who are dating in their later years, 50s, 60s, and 70s? I know that's kind of broad. So I'll let you pick up where you like there. Well, well uh, I'm uh, getting a feedback from you. Uh, okay, I think you can hear me out fine. Okay, um, you know, dating, uh, when we start dating again in our 50s and 60s, it's really like we're teenagers again. That's, it's always awkward to date, uh, particularly how much experience that we have. Many of us were got married when we were young and then suddenly we get older, we get divorced or our spouse dies, as in my case. Uh, you start dating again, it becomes uh, like, well, how do I do this? So I want to mention that it's a big subject. I want to give some brief answers because there's a lot of questions today. I do address that a lot in my book, uh, Mars, Venus on a Date. The challenges at, as you get older and you're a woman is that your masculine side is more developed. 
that's natural. After, after menopause, your estrogen levels start to drop. And unless you become really an expert at being feminine, which is estrogen, uh, you tend to become more masculine. And so what you wanna use dating as an opportunity to strengthen your feminine side and don't fall into the, the well of going onto your masculine side. It's easier to be on your masculine side. Now, let's say you're young and you're in danger or you feel threatened or you feel low self-esteem or you feel a lack of confidence, you will naturally go more to your male side because it's your protector. Ideally, the female side is someone loving you, supporting you, being there for you. Now, none of these are absolutes, they're extremes, but one's on the left, one's on the right. We wanna find the middle point. But as you get older and you're a woman, it's more challenging to find your female side because hormonally, it's much easier. Even if you're feeling safe and confident and good about yourself, <laughs> you go to your male side. So the key here is you don't have to have the estrogen levels you had as a young woman to feel feminine. You just have to do uh, be, to stimulate your estrogen levels in balance with your testosterone levels, which is your more protective side, independent side, logical side, can do lady, you can do it all. So on the dating situation, you wanna use dating uh, as an opportunity to develop and grow your feminine side, because that's always gonna be a challenge as you get older. Now, so what you do is you recognize that men actually like to be tools. Women don't, so this would be offensive, you know, oh. <laughs> but, but <laughs> men want to be used. We like our tools, we are a tool, we like our cars. I mean, men fall in love with their cars, right? You know, look at my car. If you dent a guy's car, it's like, oh, my car, it's dented. You know, they, they bond with tools. And so what does it mean to be a tool? It means I want to provide something for you and be appreciated. So your feminine side is your wisdom, inner intuition that says, uh, what would make me feel good? What would make me feel happy that doesn't have to do with serving another person? Okay, that's it. So on the date, you want to be clear in a gentle way, always in a gentle way, because these days the male ego is so fragile. And clearly as men get older, their estrogen levels rise. While yours go down, his estrogen levels, yeah, they go up. So he, he needs a little gentle, a gentle approach, which some women would be considered coddling as like, I don't want to coddle a man, but actually that's how you love a man, but not like a child. You just have to recognize that just as you're out of balance, typically, because our society doesn't support women being on their female side, our society is really not rewarding men for being on their masculine side. So there's a lot of challenges today in our self-esteem, both as women and men. So what I suggest is things that might seem like coddling, but actually it's about you taking care of what you would like, what you would need. And so I'm over here, a man telling you what will actually help you get a man to be interested in you and be happier on a date. Now, I remember when, when Mars Venus on a date came out, uh, a reviewer in New York City, and already if you live in New York City, you're way on your male side. <laughs> okay, it's just like there's certain places that just push you to the male side. Not that you can't be also also on your female side. But one reviewer reviewed the book with four other dating books and said, "Well, I never found a good. I never got in a, a committed relationship following any of these dating books. But when I follow John Gray's advice, I had a great time." and I really enjoyed myself. Well, that's the goal. I promise you that if you can date men and have a good time, enjoy yourself, not only will you be happy, but you will also find the right guy for you. It just takes time. Who knows how much time? It's different for everybody. But you wanna create a series of positive dating experiences. Don't look for perfection, look for positive dating experiences and use the man to provide a date for you. You wanna let him know three options. These are things I like to do. You pick, oh, I'll pick, he says. Don't ask him what he wants to do. It's about what you would like to do. It's about what you enjoy. Number two, these are cardinal rules. Number two is when you're talking to him, make sure he talks a lot more than you. Ask questions. Oops, I reversed it around. Excuse me, that's what women tend to do. Okay, yes. so uh, make sure, you you are talking, I'm not sure what I just said, but make sure you're talking as a woman, 
and he's listening more. Because what you do as women instinctively, because you know what you need, you want someone to be attentive to you, interested in you, because your mother taught you and you probably taught your daughters. If you want somebody to be interested in you, you should be interested in them. Actually, right. Right. don't ever be more interested in a man than he's interested in you. Even if you are more interested, he's probably the wrong guy then because you're pursuing him. Instead, the men who are interested in you, what you want to do is use that interest. And when you're having conversation with them, sometimes they don't talk. Sometimes they talk too much. But regardless, if he's not talking at all, then you talk more. Occasionally ask a short question, a question, short answer, and three cardinal responses. Oh, that's a good idea. Well, that makes sense. Well, you're right about that. And then talk more. The more you talk, a man can penetrate you basically he's going into your heart he's into your mind that's how he bonds with you as long as he feels uh that, he, that you're appreciating that so what do you need most to come back to your female side the bottom line and we'll finish up this question is to have somebody hear you to feel safe and express how you feel what you think what you want and that means absolute authenticity that's such a beautiful experience but if you're pursuing somebody trying to win them over it's hard to be completely authentic. We have these automatic childlike reactions where we want to people please. Mm -hmm. uh, and then we have the opposite of that for some women, which is want to argue to express your authentic self. Don't argue, <laughs> actually practice something called making it okay for two people to have different points of view. And how do you do that? You just keep checking. Am I trying to change his point of view or am I working to appreciate the difference between our points of view and appreciate his perspective? The secret with men in dating is appreciation, appreciation, appreciation. That allows him to be more interested in you and get to know you and bond with you. So hopefully that's some good advice. And that one little confusion I had, I don't know where that came from. It's just simply make sure that you don't ask him so many questions, but that you talk more. And so if he starts talking a lot, how to get him to stop talking is when he pauses, say something complimentary, like, oh, that's a good idea. That reminds me of, and start talking more. So use him to take you on dates, pay for the date, and hear what you're feeling. And you'll have an opportunity to experience an increase of your feminine energy, which is the receptive energy. It has to do with estrogen in your body, and it will create greater well being and happiness as you find the right person for you. Mm. Yeah, thank you. There was so much there, John, uh, such a wealth of advice and wisdom. So the two complaints I hear from women frequently about men is either they don't talk at all, like it's hard to get them to talk at all, or else they talk nonstop and never ask a question at all to a woman. So can you just give us a tiny little bit more on what to do on those? Okay, yeah, absolutely. And you're absolutely right. I know the situation. So <laughs> you, you get the guy who, uh, who talks too much. Almost, almost invariably in that situation, the woman is a quote, good listener, even though inside she's getting sick of him, almost disgusted with him <laughs> and trying to be polite. Don't try to be polite, but be considerate, be kind. So recognize in most cases when a guy's on a run-in sentence it's because you're a good listener. You have to become a little distracted. Don't ask more questions. His job, if I had men here and I was on a dating call with teaching men how to date, I would say, men, you need to ask more questions. Questions like, help me understand that better. Tell me more. What else? But see, the men are not listening here. It's mainly women. So how do you get them to stop talking? Stop asking him questions. Show a little interest. And also express a different point of view. You are different from him. We're all different. We think differently. Don't hesitate. That's called people pleasing. It will sabotage your enjoyment in the dating process and the potential of finding the right person for you if you're looking for a companion in life or a life partner. So that's the key there. Stop asking questions and interrupt. If he's talking too much, you find a moment where he said something and there's a pause. At that moment, you could even say, hold on, hold on. What was that you said? I think what you just said is da, 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 da. That makes good sense. That's really a good idea. Or wow, that's so interesting. I had never thought about that. And then share whatever you want to share about your life, what you think, how you disagree. You can do that. That makes the attraction greater is authenticity. 
to reveal your true self, what you think, feel, want, wish, need, all that good stuff, but it never works to reveal that stuff if behind it is your arguing, you're trying to manipulate, you're trying to change, you're trying to make his point wrong instead of like, well, that's so interesting. Uh, I'll give you an example of that real quick is what I practice trying to be a loving person and an open person is watching in the news, although I don't watch that much, both the people on the left and the people on the right. How can you hear both sides without getting upset with them? That's a talent. And if you have love in your heart, and that's what we want to develop, you know, as we get older, we should find wisdom. And wisdom is the ability to synthesize opposite points of view. That's one aspect of wisdom. And I even read a research study done about 15 years ago, and I still can't find it anymore. So excuse me for quoting this, but it was there. And it said that the brain was growing in people. The, the brain continues to grow beyond 50 and 60 and 70 through the ability to synthesize opposite points of view. It's wow. literally, we are designed in order to integrate our different points of view because we have enough self-esteem to do that. You know, younger people, when they hear another point of view, they're still trying to prove themselves. So they want to push to control. They have not such good self-esteem. So let's come back. Let's find our wisdom and practice it. And you can do all that in dating. It's really quite fun if you just use it for that purpose. So now the guy who doesn't talk at all. Okay. So, yeah, this right. clown, this quietly. Clown, clown. so what you have to do is, first of all, ask him to solve a problem. Okay. What do you think about? blah, blah, blah. Never ask him what does he feel. Okay. And that's even for both sides. Don't ask men what they feel. Okay. Period. Ask him what he thinks. Give him a problem to solve. You know, I read in the paper the day, so-and-so, so-and-so says, what do you think they should do? Or why do you think they do that? Or what do you think they should have done? Put men in the problem solving mode and they'll talk. And maybe, you know, you don't really need that help in your life, but you're trying, what you're trying to do is get a conversation going here. And did you see that movie? You know, what did you think about it when so-and-so said this and this and this? You know, sometimes my wife and I just generate conversation because we're married 34 years. And, you know, you've kind of had all your conversations. <laughs> right. <laughs> now, two things would happen. First of all, it was one, one is when we'd have guests over, and then Bonnie would say, John, tell them about that. Tell them about that. So I could tell all my stories again, and she wasn't bored by it. But after you told all your life story to your partner, you had so much, what's there to talk about? So what Bonnie would do is we'd watch shows, we'd put it on pause, and she'd say, what do you think they should have done in that situation? What do you think she could have done in that situation? Well, how could they have resolved that? You see, put men in the problem solving mode. And we did even another thing, which is I talk about how men, if you really understand men, you realize they, some men are exceptions, but they almost always make sense. Okay? That's their, their whole masculinity is about being logical and making sense with situations. And so if you were, if you were to, uh, to, to, she was, you know, she would see me getting upset sometimes with a person's point of view in the news or whatever. And she'd say, oh, Josh, tell me why you think that guy, what he's doing is making sense. Why do you think that makes sense? Because oh. I, you have to come back to, well, it makes sense because if I believed X, Y, Z, then it would make sense to do, uh, if I believed A, B, C, then it would make sense to do X, Y, Z. You see, everything is logical if somebody's not being emotional. If somebody's being emotional, let's keep that in, in, in look at that side of it. It's uh, a lot of emotion means no logic. And a lot of logic means no emotion. And men are best when men are angry, upset, irritable, passive, grumpy, resistant, all the worst qualities of men, it's because they're not being logical. They're too emotional at those times. And we can measure that because their estrogen levels, estrogen goes up with emotions. And whenever women are not happy, they're having negative emotions, the logic they're using is wrong. We have to all recognize one of the most beautiful things we can do is not trust our feelings when we're as being fully logical if, if we're not feeling love 
And when you're feeling love, you don't feel angry, you don't feel sad, you don't feel hurt, you don't feel any of those things. Now, you can love someone, yes, and feel sad. Like when Bonnie died, oh my God, I've never, two years of massive grief and sadness and disappointment. Yesterday was actually the anniversary of her death and it was a hard day for me and uh, very, very painful. But when you're feeling pain, it's not that I don't love her, but in that moment, I wasn't feeling love. You see, it's kind of like remembering love. It's lo I love you so much, but you're not here. It's There's a pain associated with, as opposed to coming back to gratitude love, that she's in my life, that you know I have a beautiful life now, and I know she's in my belief system. She's moved on to another world. She's happier there, and she's looking over our family. You know, so see, that's love. See, love is peaceful. Love is open. Love is accepting. And when we love someone and we lose them, then, you know, we, 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 we're feeling all these negative emotions. There's love there too, or you wouldn't have those negative emotions, but you're not fully feeling the love. So let's come back to fully feeling the love and not buying into these negative emotions. And of course, the negative emotion that really, if I analyze the pain I feel is that I failed her in some way. If I'd been a better husband, she wouldn't have died. You know, no, I had nothing to do with her death. It was cancer. But, you know, there's that place where you feel, if only I'd been better. You know, another one is a fear, you know, I'll never find love again. That's what the brain goes into. Another fear is I'll always feel pain. These are all lies. But if I have the feeling, the, if I feel afraid, I'll always feel this way, pain, then that's my fear then I, I'll, I'll continue to be in pain because I'm living in fear. All negative emotions are pain. So we have to know wisdom is so important to know that pain is healed through love. We have to feel our emotions and let them go, but we can only let them go by recognizing they're not true. The logic in them is faulty in some way. Okay, well, that's a little extra thought on that one. So I come back to the basic question you asked, which is he doesn't talk you need to ask him questions, get him in touch with solving problems, activate that logical mind inside of him. And then he will share more. Then he'll really get into it. Then you want to stop him so you can talk more and he gets to know you. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you so much. So I just want to make sure I got that right and emphasize this for the women listening to John. And that was, you said, don't fully trust your emotions unless you're feeling love. So in other words, our emotions are not necessarily logical or they're not necessarily something we want to fully trust if we're feeling more of those negative emotions. I just want to make sure we're really clear on what you mean by that. You know, this is a, 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 su a subject that takes a lot of emotional intelligence to really get what I'm saying. So let's go a little deeper into that because people will argue to their death why they feel so hurt okay, or why they hate somebody, <laughs> or why, you know, why they're upset. We, we use the external world to justify our unhappiness. Now, wouldn't it be great if we could recognize that the external world triggers our unhappiness, but we are capable of letting go of that by, by challenging the logic behind the emotion, okay? Which is, let's say you're, with some, uh, you're dating and a guy doesn't call back. Okay, mm -hmm. so what are some of your conclusions you're going to have? You're going to, you, often women feel hurt. You know, maybe you opened yourself up and then he pulled away. Well, you feel like, oh, I feel so hurt. Well, now let's challenge what that hurt is about. Did he hurt you? Actually, you had a good time on the date. He just didn't call you back. That triggers feelings of hurt. So you have to ask yourself why you feel hurt. You had an expectation that he was going to call you back if you had sex with him or you spent this time with him and you have this belief system, he should have called you back if he, if he was a good person. Well, maybe he had sex with you and realized that he's just not into you, you're not the right person for him, and he didn't wanna call you because you'd say, well, why didn't you call back? And he'd give you detailed instructions why you're the wrong person and he doesn't wanna hurt you. <laughs> so, so, so not that he's a bad person, he was just not into you. But where does the hurt come from? That doesn't cause hurt just because somebody's not into you. When I go out on the streets every day, no, people ignore me all the time. They're just not into me. Many people read my book and don't like it and throw it away. Just many more do like it. But you know, that's not about me, that's about them. So we take things personally that are not about us, it's about them. Or maybe he didn't call you back because he has an intimacy problem. That's not about you. 
and says he has a problem. It'd be like saying, hey, if you if you care about me, if I'm a lovable person, then you're and you're in a wheelchair because you have a problem, you should stand up and walk. Well, he can't do that. You see, we personalize everything. That's where the pain comes from. If you go deep into the feeling of hurt, you're scared. It triggers a button inside of you that says, I'm scared no one will ever love me. I'm scared I'll never get the love I need in my life. I've been out with several men and this has happened each time. Is there something wrong with me? What's wrong with me? Well, there's nothing wrong with me. Something's wrong with them. See, we get in all these logical loops when because we're just not understanding where our feelings come from, these faulty conclusions, expectations, and demands that we have inside, as opposed to learning from every experience without taking it personally. So this is a big challenge. You know, I've got over 10 hours at my Facebook Live on healing the heart. We have to recognize that all of our painful emotions have to do with other things. So that's why they're not fully logical. They're understandable, they're valid, that's what you feel. But to acknowledge that right now, something that happened or yesterday happened, causing that to make me feel this, that's an illusion. Imagine your husband leaves the light on and you want him to turn the light out. That was a big frustration for my wife. We have a big house and I would leave lights on and she's turning out lights all the time. Well, the first time I did it, my husband didn't turn out the light. I had to turn out the light. It's not upsetting. It's when it happens again and again and again and again, you form a conclusion that my husband doesn't love me. He doesn't care about me. What I want is not important. Are those things true? No, but you feel so frustrated and so hurt inside. He didn't do what he said he was going to do. And you feel like I just can't trust. And what does that mean? Not I just can't trust him to turn out the light. It means I can't trust that he loves me. So that's an exaggerated experience based upon other experiences, as opposed to being logical in this moment, what am I feeling? Now you add to that same thing. This is what Freud explained. It was the basis of modern psychology, which is that whenever you have an emotional reaction, if it's not really close to loving, you're overreacting. Basically, mm -hmm. let's say I come home and my husband's left your woman and your husband's left shoes and mess around the house. Well, let's say you just won the lottery and you had many wonderful things happen that day and you come home and there's a mess. You know, you'd have a problem with it. But because you had such a bad day, five things happen, you're going to be five times more upset. 20 things happen, you're going to be 20 times more upset. You're going to, oh, I'm exhausted. I'm tired. He's done it again. You see, other things contribute to our emotions and the emotions just accumulate and accumulate and accumulate. And not only do we have the things that have happened all day today, but in the last 20, 10 years of the marriage, then you've got your whole childhood compounded. Okay, mm -hmm. so if I felt you know, I was never appreciated by my parents, I'm a man, and I never felt good enough for my parents, then all my wife has to do is look at me and go, how could you do that? And I go, how can you look at me that way? You know, and you get all upset with your partner. And the problem with marriage and the problem with dating when you have sex with somebody, as soon as you have sex three or four times, you activate all of your childhood wounds. Suddenly, you're no longer just two people having a conversation and a simple disagreement, or making fun of each other. Why would you say that? Well, I was just kidding you. Well, that's no big deal. Don't worry about it. You can take that stuff. But then once you're having sex, all the rules change at that time. You know, sex changes everything. Yeah. So we have to recognize a whole different set of rules come into play if you're going to have a sexual intimate relationship. And so everybody who's listening, I know, have been in sexual relationships and it dried up. Why does it dry up? Because we don't know these relationship skills that I teach, which some women who are more cynical and burnt out will call it coddling. And, and you know, it'd be like, how do you treat a man if you want to have him continue to desire for you in sex? Not like a child, but even more considerate with more love because you've got to throw in admiration. You've got to throw in asking for help and all kinds of new skills that women today are not taught. So it's a big picture, but boy, what a fun thing to do is to learn this stuff through dating. If you have a guide and that's why you're doing this for people is why I do this for people. Let's have a guide for us to find true love and find out what love really is. Not this uh, resentment and lack of forgiveness and indulging and complaining and negative emotions and judging. You know, I, you know, I've seen it all as a, as a counselor, or whatever. And every time anybody comes to me over 40 years 
and mostly it was more women than men that come to counselor, counselors. That's 90% statistically. And every time a woman tends to wanna, how do I change him? How do I get him to do this? And always I listen to their feelings to build, you know, understanding and give her what she needs to lower her stress level so she can then hear how she is responsible for everything that happens in her life. And sometimes women hear me talk and they say, oh, he's just letting men off the hook all the time. I say, no, if you want to change your relationship, you can't change anything unless you take 100% accountability for results you get. And if I'm talking to the men and I do men only classes, I, you know, I teach men, I'm like a, a, a Marine sergeant. I tell them every single thing that happens in your relationship, it's your fault, it's your fault, it's your fault. But you see, I'm not in a blame game. I'm in an accountability real, re realization. If you want to change, if you're motivated to change, you have to look at how you have to change the way you think, how you feel, how you react, how you date, how you respond, when you have sex, how you have sex, all those things. It's about our power inside of ourselves to change is the only thing that can change the outer world, not trying to go out and change a man. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so powerful, so powerful. And I'm seeing some of the comments coming in, John, and people are saying things like, like, this is such an ultimate, this is like the ultimate growth opportunity or the journey of life. And I do believe the journey to love, and you're talking a lot about love and that inner wisdom that can come from love and from life. Um, I do believe it's like the journey of life. I believe this is really ultimately one of the biggest, biggest journeys that all of us are on as human beings in our lives is to find that path to love, not just love with an intimate partner, but love to become beings of love. Yeah. You know, to be a being of love, it's actually very scary. Mm. And it, you know, when I go into my love space, uh, also, one aspect of pure love is choice. See, when you pick a partner, that moment where you're falling in love, you're choosing this person for a lifetime. Okay, that, that's what, the lo what love is. I'm choosing this. And how many times as we get older that we choose things that it didn't work out? Yeah. I chose this and it didn't work out. I chose this investment. I chose this car. I chose this person. I chose this situation. When, when you love, you fully, you're making a choice. And that's the ultimate state of human existence is to recognize we do have free will. Free will is choosing. I choose this. I'm free. I can choose this or not choose this. And when you're loving, you're choosing. You're not trying to change. You're choosing this moment. And it's a very scary thing because the more we have failed in life, been hurt by life, we're afraid to choose that this is the situation I'm in, but it is the adventure you're talking about. It's the journey. And we all just sort of open up to this pure love state and then we become afraid, okay? We become afraid. And we may not even feel what we feel when the fear is there. You know, if somebody's angry, I could say to them, you know, you're also afraid. They go, oh, I'm not afraid. I'm just saying what's right. I said, no, I think you're quite afraid. If you were actually cool, calm and collected and trusting, there'd be no big deal here. You wouldn't be trying to argue with me or change me. And certainly you wouldn't be upset with me. So we don't always know the layers of what we're feeling inside, but deep inside, we're all here in this great journey of life to learn how to love. And it is the most beautiful moment, you know, where you're just choosing every moment, choosing the moment. And when we think about the bigger picture of life and all the, everything we've gone through and the ups and downs and so forth, choosing being present you know people talk about being present is choosing this moment it's important to have a sense of grace that actually if you can look back on your life and realize take a moment to imagine that you're where you want to be you would have never gotten here had not all those mishaps taken place so you know when i look at my life i feel so blessed i'm so grateful that's another part of being able to feel choice it be i'm so grateful and I would have not gotten here had this person not cheated me, had this marriage not had failed. My first marriage was two years and it was a failure. It was uh, my wife fell in love with another man. I felt devastated. I felt this is the worst thing that ever happened to me. But then, you know, it took me about a year to heal my heart after that, you know, and, and 
after that, I called up my wife, Bonnie, who I dated before. I wanted to marry her, but she didn't want to marry me. And I said, I've changed. I have wisdom. I'm better. And when we had a beautiful, we have a beautiful family. We lived 34 years together. I would have never had that ex- opportunity if I'd stayed in that other marriage. You know, so what we have to recognize, if we can look back at our life with gratitude and forgiveness. Now, to forgive, there's a great definition of forgiveness from Jerry Jampolsky, which is, Forgiveness is looking in the past and realizing it couldn't have been any other way. Mm. You see, it's like for me, I needed that my first wife to fall in love with another man and cheat on me. Otherwise, I would have never left because I'm a real stay in there kind of guy. (laughs) I needed needed an explosion to happen to get me out of that marriage because I'm all about love and commitment and fidelity and everything. But that did it. And that from one level, freed me then to find Bonnie, my true love in life, my soulmate. And, but I would have never done that had that not happened. And then I look at many of the mistakes I made it because, and had I not made those mistakes, I couldn't have learned the lessons that I've learned in life and gained the wisdom that I have now. So it's to be grateful for our lessons, to be grateful for the mishaps, as well as the accomplishments and the achievements and the help that we've gotten both. And sometimes we can't feel actually gratitude that somebody cheated us or whatever directly. Thank you for doing that to me. But we can all first step is thank you for what I've learned from that. But now I go back on those big mistakes, all those bad things to go. Thank you for doing that to me. Literally, that's wisdom is when you realize it couldn't have happened any other way because you're on a journey and you had to learn and in and, and this planet of earth level school. You know, this is a place we're learning to love. And to think about it very simply, if I want to build muscles, which I don't care that much about muscles, quite honestly, I just want good, strong muscles. I don't need to be a big, big guy. But the uh, I go to the gym once a week. That's good enough. So I'm always building a little more muscle mass. That's what I like is to keep growing. I'm always getting more, a little bit more, a little bit more. And I have to go to the gym and I have to pick up heavier and heavier weights and there I can grow. Well, Mm -hmm. if we want to grow in love, what happens? We're going to be challenged. And I think besides just love and life, what we want to grow in is our authenticity is to realize that we're on a journey. We're in the process of learning who we are, expressing our best self. And as we're in that journey and that becomes our motivation in life that we're growing, then it's easier to love. Mm -hmm. Well, so powerful, so powerful, John. There's so much there. I know that I myself, and I'm sure many of the women listening, are going to want to listen back to all of this. So I, ha- I want to make sure I weave in a few more of these questions in our remaining time. Um, and I think this one is kind, of, is kind of funny in a way. This is from Debbie. She says, um, what are some female traits that men don't like but generally endure? Not what would be considered deal breakers, more of the stuff that grates on them over time. (laughs) (laughs) Never had that question before, but I do have enough life experience as a man to come up with that. Uh, I'll give you the, the, we'll go into some traits in a moment, but let's do the three main categories that men will complain about. Uh, Is that she complains too much, she nags, and she controls. And most women are aware that they complain too much, okay? And most women are aware of nagging. Oh, you said you're going to do that. You didn't do it. When are you going to do that? You stay on the case. And when he has some resistance to something. And so, but most women are not aware of how they control. And, and sometimes men can't even articulate how you control, but they feel controlled. And they'll say that, I feel controlled. And... Uh, so you have to kind of understand male psychology, understand why we, were, we feel control when you don't even know you're controlling and it's certainly not your intention to control. But a man's primary motivation in a relationship, if you're being selfish, I want to feel happy. But the way I feel happiest is when you're happy. Okay, that's the reality. If a woman is happy, he's happier, period. If I take her to the movies, I want to go see the movie, yeah. 
but I'm taking her to the movies and she really likes it, then I feel like I wrote that movie. I feel like I directed that movie. I feel happier than I could feel on my own if I can provide something for you. And you just don't have that experience, women. You know, <laughs> I could have a really burnout trip going somewhere around the world, teaching classes and playing, you know, things don't work out well with the flights and maybe the audience or whatever. Some bad things happen. I'm all stressed out, feeling kind of down. If I come home, my wife is happy, all that washes away. But if I go out and have a great time, have a happy, 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 and my wife's having a hard time, oh, you know, the toilets overflow, you weren't here, the kids got sick, I couldn't get in touch with you. You know, she could go on a big long list of frustrations. And I come home and she's feeling that way. And I said, oh, I just met so-and-so, this movie star. I stayed at the best hotel. It was fantastic. I got standing ovations. And she can see I'm on top of the world. She's going to be going to be even more upset, more upset. Yeah, you have all the fun. You have the good stuff. You're not designed to find your happiness through a man's happiness. You're designed to find your happiness through the support a man can give you in relationships. You're also designed to find happiness on your own, with your children, with nature, with God, with education, you know, with service, making money. All these things are designed. But when it comes to a man, your primary source of happiness from him is what he can do for you, period. It's not what you can do for him. Don't get lost into that. That's your mothering energy. And, you know, sometimes people will complain, oh, you're saying, women, we should do this, we should do that. Why should we do all this stuff? To get what you want. Just like if you go to a job, what do you do? I'm just giving you the instruction manual of how do you get what you want from a guy, which will make him successful and making you happy. This is all about what can we, what can you do as women to get what you want? Not to give him what he wants, although that's part of how you get what you want. Because if you, for example, appreciate a guy for the things he does, he's going to do more. And if you do these annoying, irritating things, he's gonna do less. So what are some of those annoying, irritating things, which is the question, which is first of all, nagging. It's eye contact, you know, it's what, when, you, when you complain to him about something, you look him in the eyes. He doesn't know that's why he's upset. Just don't look him in the eyes, do it less, do it less. What do we say? She makes such a big deal out of things. Oh, it's her feelings again. Oh, you know, Oh yeah, she always says she's sorry, but she never she keeps doing the things over and over and over. Uh, not that my wife did that, but I'm thinking about other men who, <laughs> who who have their various you know. There's different guys have different kind of complaints, but there's this uh, asking too much. I'm going to think of a really good relationship of a couple, and uh, they really have a good relationship. She knows how to ask for help, ask for support, but sometimes she does it too much, okay, too much. And that's one, is don't ask so much, but make sure you're asking. Now, men do not complain that she's not asking for anything, but what I'm telling you, you need to ask, you need to ask for lots of help, but not too much. So that would be uh, asking too much. Another would be complaining rather than asking, is that you'll point out what he didn't do rather than what he did do. Uh, men get upset about, um, men are not aware that they don't consciously say, oh, I just don't feel my wife appreciates me. Uh, because see, people don't always know what they really need. That's what I point out. If you appreciate a man, he is, his testosterone goes up and he's a happy camp, camp, camper. So what will happen is when, when he doesn't feel appreciated, one of the big things women will do is they'll say, I'll be the woman for a minute. I do so much and I don't feel like you appreciate me at all. That's one of the most annoying things to a man is <laughs> he's acting like you don't appreciate me at all. <laughs> it's just like, why am I married to you? Why do I come home to you? Why do I work so hard? Why do I want to provide for you? You're the one I picked. Give me a break. Why would you say I don't appreciate you? Now, granted, he doesn't appreciate you as much as in the beginning. But rather than say, I, I don't feel appreciated, which means nothing to him, uh, it, just, it just goes right by. One thing is men are the worst appreciators in the world, first of all. That's why we like women. <laughs> you have the capacity as women, when, you're, when your estrogen levels are high enough, little things make a big difference. Those roses behind you, how beautiful they are. Women see that as so beautiful. So all I can do, I can bring her 50 roses and she goes, oh, amazing, how beautiful. 
But if she has enough estrogen in her body, I can bring one rose and she'll go, oh, how beautiful, look at this. You see, women have the ability to appreciate little things and big things. And it's almost the same appreciation regardless if her estrogen levels are normal. So what we know to be biologically true about women is that when their estrogen levels are low, you can give her 50 roses or one rose, it will have very little effect. If her estrogen levels are normal, which is about 10 times more than a man's theoretically should be, uh, I average healthy man, she's gonna have 10 times more estrogen. Then at that time, when it's 10 times higher than a man, he can bring her 50 rows, her estrogen will go up with joy and happiness, or one rose, and it will go up the same amount. See, this is like, women, you're amazing. You have the capacity to appreciate so much, and you also have the capacity, if you're stressed, to appreciate nothing. So you go from one extreme to the other. So when you say, I don't feel appreciated by him, it's very annoying. It's also annoying to men when you say, we need to talk. But you have to say that because sometimes you need to talk, but it's very annoying. So what you can do is turn that into a positive is you basically just say, oh, John, I just want to talk for a few minutes. I want to talk about something for a few minutes. All right, already, that's going to take it down. Literally, you say to a man, we need to talk. <laughs> They'll run. <laughs> well, his, his stress level goes up immediately. Oh, what's going to happen now? Okay, so his stress level goes up. So... Uh, I just need to talk about something for a few minutes. Uh, let's talk about, let's, let's schedule some time, a few minutes to talk about something. So these are things she can say. Uh, it'll only take a few minutes. That's the first thing. Second thing, it's annoying because women can go on and on and you will go on and on, particularly if a guy keeps arguing with you. Okay. <laughs> so, cause you, it's like, you want to be understood, but he'll give you logical and try to tell you that you're wrong. And then you'll start all over and it goes on and on and on. And then it goes into the feeling world. It doesn't make any sense to him at all. Uh, not that you can't share feelings, but don't share them as if they're always absolute fact. You see, I feel this means that's okay. That's what you feel inside. So that's a fact. That's what you feel, but it doesn't mean it's true. Okay. So I feel like crime is increasing in Chicago. You read all the news and you say, I feel like crime is increasing in Chicago. Is it actually? No, it's dramatically gone down. Yeah, but that's how I feel. <laughs> so, okay, that's how you feel, but it's not true that crime has gone down in Chicago, but it is true that you're feeling that inside and help me understand why you feel that way. Let's talk about that. What is it you're really looking for? What is it I can do for you? You know, these are things I would teach men to do, but women have to not get into this stance of whatever their feelings are. It's like fact. No, it's a fact that you feel that. So, so uh, you start having a conversation about what we're going to do. And then suddenly it turns into how you feel about how he's talking to you. So you sidetrack the conversation into having it be about you and your feelings, as opposed to, can we put feelings to the side and talk about what's the best thing to do here? How important is this to you? How important is that to me? Let's make a compromise. That's called a logical conversation, almost like a business conversation. Leave the emotions and feelings out of it. That is what I call Mars talk. I remember one of my brothers who, he liked my work a lot, but he said, boy, with my wife, we're doing Mars talks now, and it makes such a difference. And we also do Venus talks. Venus talks is where feelings can flow. And if they come up, you know, it's about listening to her feelings, what's important. And, and, but see, to have a Venus talk, she sets it up a certain way. Otherwise men get annoyed by too many emotions and feelings and let's not just be logical. So what it would be like is you just simply say, let's talk, it'll only take a few minutes. That's one thing that sets him at ease. Then I wanna tell you some, what, some you know, the other day, uh, you said this and this and this, be very factual. Don't put any feelings in it. Just say what the topic of the discussion is, a summary statement at the beginning. You left the lights on, you didn't call me. I didn't know where you were. Keep it short, logical, no feelings. Now she then say, and I just wanna talk about how it makes me feel and it's not a big deal. Okay, boom, you can talk about how you feel. No problem for a minute if you say, and it's not a big deal. Because as soon as you start talking about emotional reactions and feelings, a man thinks you're overreacting and it's not fair. He feels like he's being blamed and criticized and then he feels controlled. Why he feels controlled is because if you're unhappy, then he has to change in order to make you happy. That's what he thinks. He doesn't really, okay, uh, your job is to be happy. If I can listen, I don't have to change anything, but then I want to change things. 
but he doesn't want to feel like he has to change. But if you're unhappy based upon something he did, and your happiness is dependent upon him changing, then I now have to change if I want to have a happy wife. And if I don't have a happy wife, then I'm not going to be happy. That's why men feel controlled. So that's a little understanding of the control issue of why the three big complaints men have is she complains too much. Those are all hidden requests. Instead, learn how to ask for help. Uh, she, she nags. Okay, she brings things up again and again and again. One thing you can do if you have a husband who just doesn't do that stuff is just don't nag, make a list and occasionally say, oh, honey, when you get a chance, would you look over the list? It'd be really nice if you could do some of those things. Done. Stop demanding. Demanding is I won't be happy unless you change. And the more you demand, <laughs> your happiness is dependent on him changing. The more he feels controlled, the more he feels unmotivated to help you, the more low energy he will have. And he will not do that list. <laughs> so have a little list of things and just remind him from time to time so you don't nag. Because there's things he said he'd do, he forgets to do it. Why does he forget to do it? You often will then turn into, well, either he doesn't love me and you'll punish him for that by withholding your love. That's one, resenting him for not do following through. But the other one is what you don't realize, and he doesn't complain about, but I'll point it out how it sabotages your relationship, is he'll, he'll forget to do those things, and then you'll just think inside, well, I'll just do it myself. It's easier than continuing to ask him. And now you're training him to do less. Okay. Yeah, yeah you're training him. Okay, so what you do is you have that list and you give him a big reward when he finally does it because he will do it eventually if you just patiently remind him about the list and no big demand. And th by that time you say, I've waited three weeks for this to happen and I'm supposed to be really happy with you. You're training him. You have to train men how to live with a woman unless your mother trained you. And the only way she could have trained, uh, unless your mother trained you or your father. And if your father didn't do it, he does it. If his father didn't do it, he doesn't know how to do it. And let me under explain to you the training that men have and have always had. We don't do little things for women. What we do is work hard for make money. Even though men don't make all the money now, women are making more money in most cases. But our training and our brain, the conditioning we have is you just do your job, make money, and that's all you have to do to make a woman happy. So anytime you're unhappy, it's like, what's wrong with you? You know, and that's the conditioned response inside of men. I watched it in my parents. My mother was a happy woman. My father made good money and, and was available. We lived in a safe neighborhood at a country club down the street. She had someone to help clean the house. What more does a woman want in that generation? They didn't, she didn't care about romance. She didn't care about being heard. She didn't feel about affection. She had a husband who didn't get angry with her, but he never got angry because she never complained, nagged, or controlled. So anyway, that's a kind of a summary. That was a fun question. Thank you. Yeah, it is a fun question. And it goes along with this next one, which you might get a kick out of too. But before I ask you this question, John, I just want to say, I think as women, sometimes we don't recognize how powerful it is to a man for us to be happy and for us to show uh, our happiness. Like a man, when he knows he's pleased us, I don't think as women, we recognize how powerful that is to a man. Now you're a man, you can back me up on this, but I don't yeah. think we recognize that. No, this is the only reason men leave. Well, there's two reasons, but the main reason men leave women. And I've seen a lot of men who want to get divorced from their wives and I've helped them change by recognizing their mistakes. They always say, no matter what I do, it's never enough to make her happy. That's it. That's the mantra of the unhappy husband. Oh, she's never happy. I did this, it wasn't enough for her. She always has a complaint. It's like a, it's like a never ending neediness. I can't give her whatever I do. There's always something wrong. I mean, that's another one, annoying thing. I do whatever I did, but you didn't do this. But why didn't you do that? Questioning, that's another annoying thing. So it's ultimately, if you want men to be engaged and involved, you have to have priorities. What's the most important thing in your life? Uh, a clean house, clean dishes, uh, everything on time, ship top perfection everywhere, or having a happy life, having someone who adores you and loves you and wants to take care of you, would give his life for you without hesitating. Now that's the main thing is a woman's happiness. And if 
Now, this is not an absolute requirement, but if your goals are to have um, passion, well, the kind of passion you'd have when you, when you make love, uh, you have to have good sexual skills and you have to enjoy sex just as much as him. So there's never a man, in my experience, who left a woman who was having regular orgasms, okay? Because that is maximum female happiness. But there's other ways. If you, if you don't have that inclination and that's not a big motivation for you, it's basically a woman's happiness. But one form of happiness is sexual fulfillment. And uh, if a woman has enough estrogen in order to have orgasms. Now, unfortunately, women don't have training in how to have orgasms. Men don't have training in how to give women orgasms. There's lots of books available. I've written a book called Mars, Venus in the Bedroom. There's classes you can take, online classes on particularly becoming very popular about women uh, learning how to have orgasms. But the, an orgasm is maximum pleasure in your body and a moment of surrender and openness and pure love. And as I said, love is scary. And when, you, when you're a woman and you open your heart in an orgasm, you bond to the man. You become, I need you. I depend on you. That's what estrogen is, is I'm, I need you and I depend on you. And that's a very scary place unless you also have a life which is not just dependent on a man. You see, you wanna depend on a man for what a man can give you, but you wanna depend on yourself for what you can give yourself. You wanna depend on your children to give you opportunities for unconditional love. You wanna depend upon education so that you're always growing. You wanna depend upon the divine or the higher power so you feel you're not alone in this world. You know, there's a lot of different needs that we have. And if you're not aware of all your different needs and how important they are, uh, then suddenly a man becomes your big need. And he should just be one of many. He's dessert as far as I look at it. Now, I, you know, the, from my point of view, my wife was dessert, although uh, she wouldn't take that as a compliment, but <laughs> I do, okay? Which is, you know, just, hey, honey, you've got an amazing life. I just want to be dessert, you know, that that's okay. But, um, but she, she, to me, is the finest dessert in the world. You, you can't replace that one. But, you know, I have my work. We all have our work. You know, that's so fulfilling. And, and relationship is so fulfilling. And children is so fulfilling. And, you know, some people aren't going to have children. And some people aren't going to have sex. You know, but they'll find for them what their needs are. But if, if you're, for your soul, sex is important to you and you're denying that, uh, you'll be too needy for other things. So we want to get neediness out of our life. And again, one of the symptoms of neediness is demanding someone to change for you to be happy. That's neediness. Needing is uh, what a person has available to you. You appreciate it. And, you know, if I'm hungry, I eat food, I get it, and then I'm done. I don't keep wanting more and more. So when we want more and more than what's available to us, that's needy. And that makes women become more critical, more demanding, more controlling, more um, nagging. And just shift gears. The whole thing is a flexibility and focusing on other things make me happy through what I say and do other than just my partner. Yeah. Uh, one other, just real quick one on that one, is there's a tendency when, for women who say, yeah, I can't depend on my partner, so I have my friends and I have this and I have this. Friends is another big need we have. Uh, and I have this and I have this and I had this, but secretly in their side saying, yeah, I have to depend on my friends because I can't depend on my husband. Mm -hmm. So they use that same philosophy I just said, which is if you're not getting from your partner, get it somewhere else, as opposed to get certain things from your partner and get other things from others. And that is healthy. And that's how life is. It's not to be resented. Uh, you know, because I've seen people do that. They kind of go, yeah, I can't get it from my husband. So I have my friends to do that. And I go, wait a second, what are you talking about? You know, what do you have from your husband? Well, that's, that's in the ballpark of what a husband should provide for you. And often husbands will not provide everything that they should provide for you. One lack of education. But what I've seen mainly is when you need more than what a man can provide, he stops giving. That's it. You know, it's, if you have complaints and criticism, you can tell me all day long all the things that are wrong, and you're right. And I would feel what you feel if I was a woman. No problem with that. But how are you contributing to the problem? Holding on to those negative emotions, those resentments, those judgments, the blame, all that stuff gets 
stuck in our brain. Uh, I remember doing a show with Oprah and she said, yeah, it's like giving free rent to your past, keeping you from being able to appreciate what you have in the now. Well, yeah, that's really powerful. So it's in part knowing and being in tune enough with our own needs to know how to ask for what we want and need. And then it's also not expecting one single person, this partner, to meet all of our needs and recognizing that it's healthy for us to still have other relationships and other outlets for interests and passions and to have other needs met. Like I believe, you know, having been married now for almost 14 years myself and spending a long time being single, I believe it's really important to maintain our individuality, our friendships. I think women need other women as far as friendships for us to really feel good and for us to look at how we can get our various needs met because that's a huge weight to put on the shoulders of any one individual person. Absolutely. Absolutely. You're right. Mm -hmm. So this question, I think you've already kind of addressed, but I want to hear if you have a little something to add here, um, because um, I think you might get a little bit of a kick out of it. She says, um, this is from D. She says, I'd love John's wisdom on this pain point, please. My man goes silent, withdraws, when I'm sorry, or even I see you, or uh, my man, oh, sorry, I, my man goes silent or withdraws. Um, when what I'm sorry, or even I see you're upset or disappointed, or that's a bummer, is what I'd really like to hear. So in other words, he goes silent and withdraws instead of acknowledging her feelings. Is there any hope for us? As soon as I get past one incident, it happens again an hour later. Examples for clarity. He damaged my favorite plant or drank the last beer at dinner without saying anything. <laughs> <laughs> I love these questions. Oh, I just love them. I love them. Okay. Uh, first of all, we, we want to understand um, why he doesn't acknowledge it. So to me, it's very, very obvious. But I just want to ask you, uh, why do you think he does that? Why do I think he does that he doesn't acknowledge her feelings? Well, he basically, no, that he doesn't say, "Oh, sorry, oh, bummer." Okay, well, you, you call I'm that not, acknowledging her feelings. I get it. I mean, he may not even realize that he's doing anything to upset her. First of all, that could be one thing. Like if he's drinking the last beer at dinner, that he may not even realize that's the wrong thing to do, or that that's going to upset her. And he probably he. he he, I don't know, he doesn't want to feel like he's been made wrong. He doesn't want to feel like he's wrong. That's right. That's it. He okay. wants to make her happy. He wants to make her happy. And so to acknowledge that he failed her is painful. So he just doesn't acknowledge. That's, so that's the, the essence of trying to understand the other person's point of view. So, okay. So he <laughs> breaks the, oh, this plan is broken. So now he feels inside clearly he broke it right so, so, so well, there's no beer left in the refrigerator you took the last one okay so he just he's gonna go in his mind oh he's thinking oh that's not a big deal why is she making it a big deal okay so why is she making it a big deal is is in his mind if he thinks she's making it a big deal he will have to go the other direction it's not such a big deal. And so now I don't know how much emotion she packed into it. So there's two situations where she put a lot of emotion into it. Like, oh, there's no beer left. Oh, my plan is so broken. Okay, let's take that first one. Okay. Now, let's just understand there's a, a biological reason for this mishap besides low self-esteem on both sides. Okay. Or some low self-esteem on both sides is when women experience moderate stress, there's no beer in the refrigerator. There's my plant broke. Oh, the ants are back in the kitchen. That's when I first learned this, okay? One day I heard Bonnie screaming from the kitchen, John, 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 come quick. Okay, and <laughs> in my mind, I thought it was lions and tigers and bears. My wife's being attacked and I ran as fast as I could to get there. And then she says, look, look, look. And I go, I couldn't see it. I wear glasses anyway, but she said, the ants are back. And I thought, 
gosh, you got so upset over these little ants. Okay, now certainly it's a challenge for us. We live on a mountain, so sometimes the ants do come. But there was such a strong emotional reaction. And right at that same time, I was reading in some scientific literature that when a woman is experiencing moderate stress, no, not like there's actually a lion outside, but it's ants, right? She will experience an increase of blood flow to the emotional part of the brain eight times more. Suddenly eight oh. times goes up. When a man experiences a small challenge, he experiences a decrease in blood flow to the emotional part of the brain. So what happens if it's a big challenge, then a man experiences a massive increase of blood flow to the brain, to the emotional part of the brain, the way a woman would experience if it's a little problem. Now it also flips, if a woman sees it as a big, big problem, she actually stops having emotions. That's she goes over to her male side and pulls up her sword and her estrogen goes down. So you see, we are absolute flips, we're the opposite. So if she's having an emotional tone, like you drank the last beer, okay? <laughs> His tendency is go, that's a lion and tiger and bear? I think not. <laughs> you see how the, the distinction is there. So what she can do if she has that emotional tone, it's good to have emotional reactions, but buffer them. Buffer them is, <laughs> honey, I know you didn't mean to break, I know you didn't mean to break the plant and it's not a big deal, but maybe next time you could be a little careful. That's it. Maybe next, just that little feather touch of reaction and he'll nod his head. Okay. Now, the next thing to do on that one are, are with the beer. I'm putting what it is. She, she says, oh, darn, you drank the last beer. I was wanting that beer. Now, I know you don't do that all the time. It's not such a big deal. But next time, will you try to remember to save the beer for me and then turn away and don't look for a response? Don't look for the response. He heard you. You got to get, he heard you. And you got to tell him your response and then look away after you said, it's not a big deal. Now, if you want to be superwoman and get a big response from him, you say, oh, darn, you, 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 you're just being authentic. You, you're not hiding yourself. Oh, that beer I was looking for, another beer. Instead of saying, you're so unconscious, you're so insensitive. How could you forget? You don't love us. You only think about yourself. <laughs> None of that stuff. And clearly she's not saying all that, but I'm just saying that's typically inside. So if she goes into, uh, oh, darn, <laughs> you, you took the last beer. I was wanting to have that beer. And you pause, you reflect, and you realize that's going to not land the right way. So then you can come back and say, it's, it's not a big deal. I know you don't do that all the time. And I'm sorry I got upset. That's it. Oh, it's okay, honey. It's okay. And next time I'll try to, to uh, leave you the beer. Be apologetic for having an overreaction from his point of view. I must have sounded awful, like it's a big deal. It's not a big deal. And I'm sorry if it sounded that way. Okay. This is the ultimate if you're a superwoman and you really want to get this stuff done. Now, I'm not expecting everybody to be perfect, but that's what would really get a response from him is if you apologize for overreacting. I kind of overreacted on that, but next time I wish you would just try to think about me. <laughs> but it's not a big deal. I'm sorry. And then he'll go, I'm sorry. And then he'll have heard that thing. Yeah, you're kind of selfish, aren't you? You need to be more considerate. It will go into his brain. Nothing goes into his brain if he feels he's being, mean, he's being rejected, he's being made wrong, he's being told he's inadequate, he has failed to make you happy. So you owning this negative response as opposed to, let's say you're this, your heart was open and he never, and he never uh, before, this is what a real response would be, a true heartfelt response. And, and not that we should, it's practical, but let's say it's the first time you were dating him and he took the last beer. You go, oh honey, you took the last beer. You know, there's another person in this house too. <laughs> <laughs> you see, there would be this lightness to it. There's a playfulness to it. That's the dating process where people don't get all bent out of shape. It's because he's done those things over and over and over. She's going to have a stronger reaction. And so that's not a in the moment reaction. It's a stronger reaction than appropriate to the situation. Appropriate if you take into consideration it's happened so many, many times before, but it's an overreaction. It's not about he left the beer. It's about 20 times he took the last beer in a different way. So you're not being in present time. 
If we want to have love, we have to be right here in present time with our partner and react. And when we overreact, acknowledge it. It's too bad that Freud figured this out, that almost every negative reaction is an overreaction based upon flawed logic, okay? Then what happened is men, <laughs> every time a woman was upset, men would say, you're overreacting. And then men felt like women were crazy and what's wrong with them. And then we, men would make women go crazy by saying you're crazy, as opposed to women understanding, gee, it's an overreaction, I'm sorry, I didn't mean to say it like that. And then a guy goes, oh, it's okay, I love you, sweetheart. And men would have a knowledge that of course women are gonna have stronger emotions. That's why they have such great orgasms. You know, you gotta pay the price, buddy. Sometimes she's not gonna be happy all the time. You gotta hear that stuff and, and be supportive of it so she can come back on her own. But for little things, she can come back on her own if she understands the languaging for this. Now, another thing she can say to her partner, now that's it there, she had a big strong emotional reaction. But let's say she's not having a strong emotional reaction. It could be hidden and the eyes do it. She looks at him. You took the last beer, okay. You broke, you broke my plant, eye contact. So don't make the eye contact because you can't hide your feelings. They show up through your eyes, okay? But you don't wanna dump your feelings on them if, if that's the way you're gonna deal with this. So the next thing you do is, it's not a big deal, but if you, see, imagine you could actually laugh at it. You broke my plant again. You see, that would be if you had no resentments and no lack of, and you didn't trust him anymore and your heart wasn't closed to him. Or, oh darn, I was really wanting that beer. Will you try to remember in the future? See, men can hear that, but it's something about the way she says it is gonna make him feel, and maybe it's just how many times she says it. It's the look in the eyes, it's the tone of emotions. It's all sort of gets put into that little thing. So what she can do is she can also tell him, you, this is another conversation. She just say, you know, honey, when I get upset about things like that plant, whatever, it's not a big deal, but it'd be really nice if you would acknowledge that you heard me in some way. It can be as simple as, I hear you. You don't have to say you're sorry. You can simply say, I hear you. And that was really key, changed our marriage, because Bonnie would look at me, you forgot again, or you didn't call me, and it'd be like a stare. And I didn't know how to break into it, and I know what she was looking for is just what this woman said, is some kind of acknowledgement like, gee, I'm sorry. But when a man is in a defensive place, particularly over something small, he can't say, I'm sorry, and actually feel it. He can't. Because what happens to him under a small stress is blood flow stops to the emotional part of the brain. And I'm sorry is a feeling statement. Mm -hmm. But he can say very easily is, I hear you. That's it. He doesn't have that knowledge. Uh, to say that. And there's no agreement between the two of them. You don't want to get upset about little things and I express it. I don't require an apology from you. I know you care. Just simply say, I hear you. That's good enough. And then we're done. So that's the key to this. Give him something he can say, even if he is having that defensive response. And that's appropriate. Let's say everything I said about what women typically do, and you're this perfect woman, and you didn't have any of that frustration, any of that disappointment, any of that resentment, any of that rejection, any of that uh, going on inside of you, and you said it perfectly, honey, you know, you didn't leave the last beer for me. Didn't you think about me? Whatever it might be. And, and if that's the case, and he still doesn't respond, he doesn't know how to respond because it's a little thing. Just give him something he can say, which is, I hear you. And that really saved us in our marriage because Bonnie would a little, when it was little things, you forgot to call so-and-so and stare at me. She would kind of get locked into a, a lock, demanding in a sense, me to say, oh, I'm so sorry, I meant to do that, I forgot. But I couldn't say it because I was in my defensive spot. You know, Ironically, men are more defensive when you get upset about little things than if you got upset about something big. If I did something big, I can hear it, okay? <laughs> because I deserve it. Okay, it makes sense. It, it makes more sense to be upset at a, a strong emotional level if the problem is really big. But to us, it doesn't make sense. Although it does make sense when I talked about the science, but men don't understand that and it's not instinctive. So what you do is you just have little qualifiers and you have learning lessons of what you can say and what you can do. You know, example, another example. So we agreed on 
me simply to say, uh, I hear you. And what she practiced doing is in looking away, okay, just to look away very quickly to make it a whole and easy interaction. And part of this requires understanding the way men think, which is that if you want a man to think about his mistakes, don't make him a bad guy. Make him a good guy and he'll reflect on how to be a better guy. If you make him a bad guy, all he can do is, is forget it, to push it away, to ignore it, to defend it, to justify, to put it down, because we all wanna feel good about ourselves. And when you have sex with a woman and you're a man, you're more dependent on what she thinks about you than anybody else. See, it says my happiness. I mean, you, you can't imagine how fantastic men feel when their wives have an orgasm, okay? When he gave her the orgasm, which I'll just throw in here. It's another problem for women who are singles. They're using your vibrators. And that's not a, yin, that's not a, a feminine orgasm that you're having. What you're doing is like a man masturbating. You're doing it to yourself. You're not having a relationship unless you love your vibrator. <laughs> And it's not a person. It's, a, it's the equivalent of a man going online and masturbating to porn, which also destroys a man's ability to get turned on to a real woman. And that's all proven. Same thing with women using vibrators. What you want is you get a guy doing it to you. And there's a lot of guys that will do that, but you don't want that unless your heart's open first. So, you know, to, to, to do it alone is just to affirm that I am alone and I can't get love. And these are not good messages to give to yourself either. So, Date, don't wait. That's Date, a nice don't book wait. Book. <laughs> I John, I want to ask you one question about this eye contact thing that you said. Is that because not don't make the eye contact or look directly at him? Is that because we don't we're giving him the death stare if we're looking at them that we're just you know glaring at them? Why why do we not want to look at them when we're saying what we're saying? Is it well a nice a simple way of looking at it is the death stare. Yeah. But even if it's not so much the death stare, which is death, his testosterone shoots down. Whatever you're trying to get him to remember or hear will not be heard, will not be effective, will only have the opposite effect. Uh, you know, the Greeks talked about the death stare in terms of Medusa. Okay, So somebody <laughs> lessened in that story, but she has snakes, which are complaints. Cut off one, compl and this is for men to learn, cut off one complaint, you'll get three complaints. Okay. <laughs> Three snakes come back, see, and you can't kill her. You can't cut off her head. But basically what she will do is she'll look at you and you'll turn to stone. That was the whole thing. A woman's stare will turn a man to stone. Literally, he stops having any heartfelt emotions. Just turn them off completely. And for the men in that story, what you learn in that metaphor is you, you've got to cut off her. You've got to cut off her head. OK, you got to get her out of her head which is justifying her emotions and blaming you. How do you do that? You gotta get her out of her head back into her heart. How do you get her in the heart to make the complaints go away? You have to cut off the head, don't argue with her, but approach her and look at her death stare, but through your shield, that's how he did it. The shield is to not look at her directly from your point of view, but to look at her through the reflection, which means to hear what she's saying from another point of view not your point of view, but another point of view, then you can get her out of her head. And that's by understanding where she's coming from. What a great you know, metaphor this whole Medusa thing is. But yeah. for women to know there, it's your stare. Now, uh, there's a theory I have, I call it the alphabet theory, which is, let's say your partner does something to annoy you. The first time it's letter A. He does it again, it's letter B, letter C, letter D, letter E. It goes all the way to X, Y, Z. Now, as it goes through those stages, there, as, as this example, uh, the first stage is you feel this annoyance and resistance. You don't like it, but nothing changes. Then you'll go into uh, a resentment. Usually you'll try to give more than your partner's giving to you to, make, you know, to try to make things better and you'll resent it if nothing's changing. So now you're in resentment. These are the four R's. And then after you have this resentment build up at a while, you just give up and you just start, there's a, ten, you're not even aware of this, but now you're in a place of rejection. Your mind's always looking at what's wrong with them. Just looking, and he says, let's go do this. Oh, I'm not in the mood to do that. I wanna do that. It's this oppositional thinking that starts happening in couples. They just can't agree on anything. Everything seems like a big burden and I have to sacrifice if I was to give you what you want. 
that's all a fabrication of the brain with so many repressed emotions and feelings due to so much repressed annoyance, not changing things around, which either changing your expectations, communicating about it, trying to work it out. And then after the third R is rejection, then you still stay in that relationship. You go to repression and that's comfort. You push down all your emotions, but you have no sex, no, no sex drive. You have no attraction for each other, but you're like business partners or family members, but you're not really lovers. And right. that's, that's the comfort zone that people get to. And most people today don't want to live in that place because it's called looking at 60 years old like you're an old person. Uh, you see people who have been repressing everything inside because they have no emotional intelligence. They age very quickly. Um, they don't have a... And th that's one example. Anyway, those are those four R's that we want to want to avoid going through, which is learning how to communicate about the little things. So the little things come up, be light about it. You know, it's not a big deal you, when you turn out, you know, I, I, I want to not give big, huge lectures because I want to answer all these questions. But here's a real quickie on asking for help rather than complaining. Uh, it'd be a complaint with you forgot to turn out the light. A request would be, oh, honey, you know, I was just walking through the living room, the light was out. I know so many times you do turn it out, but sometimes you still forget. Uh, be really nice if you try to remember, thanks, and then go out of the room. Don't expect a response. It's her whole premise of this question. I'm looking for an acknowledgement, and then I feel hurt by that, rather than purposely ignoring it, but that you're not getting a response. But there's so many better things I just said, other than just ignore it, all of this one technique. Don't expect it, because that's that look Aren't you gonna give me a response? Well, if you do have that feeling, set it up. It's not a big deal, you'll get more of a response. Or it's not a big deal, and when I say these little things, all you have to do is just glance my way and say, I hear you, and that's enough. I just wanna know I'm heard. I don't need you to say you're sorry. It's nice whenever you are, but I know with little things, it's hard to say you're sorry because it's not a big deal. You're a guy, but just say you hear me. Then mm -hmm. now you have a communication technique, you know, driving in the car. Bonnie used to tell me to slow down. That would be very annoying to me. Oh, that's another thing in the annoyance section. Women giving driving instructions can really yeah. irritate guys. Oh, and slow down, go fast, turn here. Why did you do that? You shouldn't have gone there. I can't believe you got any kind of driving instruction. So ours was usually John would, I would go too fast. And, and she asked me, how can I communicate to you that I'm uncomfortable while you're driving? I know it's very annoying to you. That's a good technique, conversation about how can I communicate what I need? And I, I thought, I thought, it took me a long time. I said, you know, it's really hard sometimes to communicate to me what you need. And I could, I could be a little sense, overly sensitive here. And, and then I came up with the answer. I said, so don't say anything. If you want me to slow down, just grab the handle. <laughs> you grab the handle. Grab the handle. Yeah, the signal. Like, <laughs> yeah, it's just a signal. Sometimes nonverbal communication is really good. I think for couples to have a really good non-communication uh, thing, particularly annoying thing, is women talking too much about their feelings. And so how can a man have her stop because he can't hear anymore? As if it's not a bad thing. You can make little signals, whatever it is. Smile and put your hands in the air. That's another one, which means I'm going to go think about what you said. But I can't, I, I, even if I say something, I, I, the tone of voice conveys you know, when a woman asks, says something, she thinks she's saying it perfectly. Well, it worked when it was A, B, C. But when you've gone through all the four R's and now it's X, Y, Z, or even to resentment, X, Y, Z. Eye contact allows a person to hear X, Y, Z, even if you're saying A, B, C. Does that make sense? I, I sort yeah. of brought that back in. You can't hide your deepest resentments with eye contact. You can mm -hmm. hide them, which is effective to do. <laughs> many times. Fake it till you make it sometimes. Okay, that's okay. Not all the time, but at crucial times, you don't need to just dump it all out there, but behave like you would in the office. You know, in the workplace, we all have to behave. You can't just throw your feelings around. And sometimes in your marriage, you have to. That's okay. Just not all the time. Yeah. Yeah, John, do we have time for another question or two before I let you um, share a little bit more about your work? Uh, yes, I'll try to keep them short so we can do more questions. Can I read a few that I've just seen? My boy yeah. enjoys Absolutely. our time together, but seems to only want to see me about once every two weeks. What's up? That's his wish. So if you want to have a partner who does more, you should let him know. You can say, you know, I really like spending time with you every two weeks, but I have a need 
And, 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 you know, maybe that's all you need in a relationship, but my need is, to, is more time together. And I don't want to be needy or anything like that, but I really would like to spend, you know, at least like uh, twice a week, whatever it is your requirement is, you should let him know. And if he says no, then very, then very nicely say, well, I really like you a lot, but actually I'm going to try to find somebody else I like because I would like to spend more time together and I don't want to change you and then end it. He will come back if he's if he if he's into you. Could be he's got other girlfriends. I don't know what is going on. But you know, men are lazy. If you give men what they want, they're not gonna do more. You gotta let them know what you want, what you need as well, and give them a little incentive and motivation. So then mm -hmm. another question is uh, about the heart monitor. Uh, I, I, I need to know more information about that, so I don't I can't answer that one. Please explain the difference between intuition and manufactured emotions. Okay, when your heart if I, the difference here is feelings and emotions. They're different. And that's hard for people to get it first. We don't have a lot of emotional intelligence in, in the world today. We're learning it, okay? So uh, if I have uh, somebody punched me in the arm, I would feel that pain. That's not an emotion. I feel the sensation, okay? So feeling is a capacity of knowing. There's I think and there's I feel, okay? These are capacities of knowing. So I can feel something, it's because it it's comes from within me. It's not sourced outside of me. That's what a feeling is. It's the ability to self-reflect and say what my inner experience is, is this. So I feel a sensation or I can feel an emotion. An emotion is a reaction to whether you got what you want or you didn't get what you want. An emotion is a reaction to you got what you expected and you wanted it or you didn't get what you expected. So the, we have expectations, desires, and needs. And when they're met or not met, we have different emotional reactions. So emotions are how we know our emotions is we can feel them or we just are them. I am angry is one thing. And many people are angry and they don't even know they're angry. They're just angry or they're just sad. Okay, and they don't even feel it, they just are it. So that's like a child, they're just angry, you know, or argue, arguing man, you know, he, he's being mean to you and you say, well, you're really angry, I'm not angry. <laughs> or, and, and of course, if somebody can say, all right, I, I am feeling angry. See, to feel is to step back and go, this is coming from within me. And when you can feel emotions, then you can step back and go, oh, I'm generating this within myself. So intuition is, thinking, feeling your thoughts. Okay, so what intuition is, is I feel what I know. I know it from within myself. And don't trust your intuition unless your heart's open. <laughs> mm. uh, just because I feel something's true doesn't make it true. But if my heart's open and I'm feeling love, then quite often that accesses, we're able to feel our ability to know what is true. Uh, mm -hmm. stress. It doesn't have to be feeling love. It can also be if you're under stress, if your hormones are out of balance, you're in stress state, usually your intuitions are wrong. But uh, intuition is knowing without depending on an external source. So that's yeah. a, I really like the answering that question. I haven't read it that way. Yeah, uh, John, can I, can I slip one in? Because I see a thread going through here and I want to make sure you have time to address this one. Okay. Oh, all these great questions. Oh my gosh. I know. I, we I have some... We should do this again. I love it. I know. Let's questions. do it again because yeah. I still have a huge stack here too of people <laughs> that people sent in from before. But okay. I want to make sure we address okay. this because I see a strong thread going through where some of the ladies are saying that they're feeling like that the women have to do like the harder work or the heavy lifting in a relationship. And that was actually one of the questions that was sent in as well. And I mean, from from my perspective. You know, I've had the privilege of interviewing you many times and have read your book. And I feel like what you're giving us are kind of the keys to the kingdom because you're giving us tools and resources that we can use to get more of our needs met and to have more deeply satisfying relationships. But I'm seeing this thread going through here that um, is where the ladies are, some of the ladies are feeling like, wait, it's all on us. We have to be the ones that change, adapt, have our perfect behavior, and so and so and so on. And we have to do the heavy lifting. I, I love what you're saying. I've encountered this for years. 
Why do I have to do the heavy lifting? Because you're the woman asking me what you can do to make your relationship better. When I talk to men, they have to do all the heavy lifting. It's what side do you want to look at this? If you want to be the agent of change in your life, this is how you do it. If he wants to be the agent of change, this is what he does. He doesn't have to be in front of me. Any man that asks me what the problem is, I'll tell him, boy, are you messing up? You're not doing the right thing. If you want to hear how men have to do the heavy lifting, you read the advice I give to men. It's what do you want in your life? You have the power. All I'm doing is telling what all I'm doing is telling you how you can get what you want. And if you heard that what we what we men have to do, just as a short thing. Men, you have to practice listening to her. You have to practice making her needs first. You have to practice not reacting and arguing with her. You have to practice, if you're angry, you can't talk to her about it. You cannot complain about anything. You have to suck it up. You have to become selfless. If there's a war, you have to give up your life. You're the one who has to do dirty, dangerous, and difficult. If there's an argument with a neighbor in lawsuit, you have to handle it. If there's a leak in the roof and a rainstorm, you have to climb on the roof and do it. And you can't complain about it. If there's dirty, smelly trash, you have to bring it out. If there's danger, you protect her. If she, and Oz, you have to give her four hugs a day. You have to empathize with her. These are things that, that nobody ever taught you to do. You have to do it. Men always say, you mean I have to do all that? I say, that stuff is easy. Once you know how to do it, are you kidding? Why would you complain about it? And what I'm saying to women, when you don't understand how you're creating the problems and making the messes in your life, it feels like a real burden and a heavy lift in order to change. And I get that. I get that because everything your mother taught you about how to have a relationship doesn't work today. Okay. Cause you want to be different. You want to have a sex life. You want to be more independent. You want to be free to say who you want. You want to have conversations. You want to talk about how you feel and what you want. Women never did that in the past. I'm teaching you how you can do it. You have to change yourself if you want a different result. So yes, we're back to, you know, it's almost like, uh, you mean I have to work at this job to make money? Yes, you have to work. <laughs> They're not going to give me a free ride. I thought the government's going to give me money for free. No, you know, you have to work for that. That's what life's about. But work is is wonderful if you know how to do it. That's the problem. And this is this all seems like, oh, I don't it's so much. It's only so much because you didn't know it before. And it's a pleasure to put it into action. See, that's the great thing. I mean. When, when I look at how to ask for more, okay, I have a 10 step process for asking for more. 10 steps before I ask my partner to do anything for me differently. Why would I need 10 steps? Because it's loving and it feels good to love. Like I would never just say you did something wrong. I first compliment first. I'd say, I wouldn't say we need to talk about that. I says, oh, you know, when you have time, when you're not watching TV, I want to talk about something. It won't, it doesn't take a long time, only a few minutes. You know, the other day you did this and this and this and you know, you don't do that all the time. And I really appreciate because you did this way one time and this way one time. And but it did push buttons inside of me. It triggered something inside of me. And I felt like, oh, what a crummy husband I've got or what a great wife, crummy wife I have. You know, you know, these are like stuff that was coming up. And it's really not even about you. It's about my own childhood stuff. It's like repressed stuff coming up and I'm being overreactive. And I'm really sorry about that, that I even had those thoughts and feelings because you're an amazing guy. And at the same time, if you, you know, try to remember to turn out the light, I'd really, really appreciate it. Just makes my life so much easier, but in the bigger picture, no big deal. Well, why did I have to do all of that? Cause it felt good to do, but if you don't know how to do it, you think, Oh, I have to coddle my partner. I have to be so delicate. Why can't I just tell him change? You know, <laughs> you know we, we have to get out of it, but you know, people, people get angry when, when, when they're basically being told you're doing it all wrong. But if you're not getting the results in your life, you're doing it wrong. And, it, and certainly they're doing it wrong too. But what use is it for me to talk about how bad men are? That's all you hear is he doesn't do this. He does, what, what good is that? Doesn't do anything good. Unless <laughs> in, in one case it does, unless you have really low self-esteem as a woman and you're one of these women and they do exist who stay with men who are very, very abusive. Because one of the things you have to do if a man is very abusive is you have to lovingly stop letting him abuse you, which means leave from the point of view, you've got a problem. If you fix the problem, the truth is I do love you if you do. And I would love to have a relationship with you, but I'm just enabling you if I stay with you. So I have to go take time 
to find my happiness not depending on you. And I recognize my part of this. I am actually bringing out the worst of you by even having sex with you, because I don't want to have sex with you. And that's not you know, your problem, that's my problem. I built up so much resentment inside and so much hurt inside. And it's not even all about you. It's about my childhood. It's about repeating patterns and my own feelings of helplessness. So, you know, it's not you and you have your problems for sure. But I know that if I was to stay with you, I continue to bring out the worst of you and, and you're responsible for your problems as well, but I don't want to add to them. So we need to part. Do you see how that, like both people are responsible for the problem, but this takes away victims. What I know to be true is when I'm in love state, not, I've never been a victim. I had things happen that helped me learn and lessons and I'm growing because of it. My life is wonderful because of the lessons I've learned and it's not perfect, it just gets better and better. That's a love state, it's not a victim state. And what I know to be the case in psychology is whatever you, any pattern you have in your life where you feel victimized, it happens again and again and again, that pattern will not change until you get that you're creating it. And mm -hmm. how are you creating? You have to find out. It could be you keep picking the wrong people. That's also a, a, a victim pattern. And because you're not willing, you have to look inside yourself that you're not open to the right people. You know, your expectations are too high. You're too picky. What, what could it be? Or, you know, I've talked a lot with you about this, about women. Often women are attracted to men who are not available. Why would you involve yourself with that? But if you're attracted to men who are not available, if you're attracted to men who are dangerous, if you're attracted to men who are married, uh, then what's going that's a problem inside of you that you would be attracted to someone who's not going to be able to give you the love you need. Your intuition is saying, I can't get what I need there, so I want it. Okay, that's your own problem inside that you pick these wrong guys. So what you have to do is recognize that if you're turned on to the wrong guys, then the right guys will not cause you to be turned on. So that's another thing. We practice having relationships with men that are more interested in you than you're interested in them and let them earn your interest by taking care of you and allowing you to use them. And when you can feel, wow, I can get this guy to do whatever I want, I'm, I'm uh, falling in love with him because he truly wants to be there for me. Instead of some guy that you have to convince, that's just bad news, that's low self-esteem, that's your issues, that's what you've got to work on in your life. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And I think this is pure gold and it's really empowering to recognize the choice that we have in staying in victimhood, right? I mean, that alone could transform so many things in our lives when you know, we recognize. It, it does, and it sounds sometimes harsh when I say it. I just want to soften it. But, you know, if a woman came to me and said, John, you're, you're, you know, you're, it just feels like I have to do everything. And I said, well, yeah, if you want to make a change, you have to make a change in yourself. At the same time, I hear you, and it's hard. It's difficult being alone. It's difficult not getting support in your life. It's difficult not understanding. These are hard things. And we could talk about that. You need to be heard. So all these women that are feeling that burden, you need to talk about somebody. That's the part of you which is a victim. Victims need to be heard, okay? They need empathy. That's the female side of us. The female side of us goes into, I did not get. The male side of us goes into, I don't know how to do. So they just need strategies, but women need to be heard. So there, there needs to be a softness to counterbalance. You know, this is how you can get, but also the pain is inside and that's where emotional intelligence, healing the heart is very, very important. You need to have friends that you can talk to and share your feelings. But in the context of this is the part of me that feels like a victim and up here in your logical brain, your intuitive brain, and I'm not a victim, but I'm nurturing myself. Because, you know, if you have a little child and they're crying, you want to listen to that child and then they smile and run off and play. It's done. So right. we have this like child inside. It feels like I can't do it. I'm not going to be able to do it and afraid I can't do it. And so then you, you know, go into a feeling like, oh, this is too hard for me, as opposed to when you learn how to do it, it's, I won't say it's easy, but, in, but when you learn how to do it, it is easy. And that's called wisdom. When you have wisdom, it's not a big deal. Life is, you know, one of my friends, he wrote that book, uh, Don't Sweat the Small Stuff, and it's all small stuff. It is all small stuff, and you, you can argue with me and everything, but when it comes to how you feel, it's small stuff. You are in control of that. That, that outer world is bad news, but how you react to it, that's what you're in control of. And that feeling of a burden is just simply, I, 
this makes me feel wrong and I don't want to look at that and I don't know how to do it else and I can't do it another way and he should make it easier for me. And I'll agree. I'll tell all men in the, to the end of the, my life, men, you need to make it easier for women. This is what we can do for them. And, and unfortunately, men used to do that by having a good job. Now we don't know what to do. You've actually made it really hard for us, not that I want to paint men as victims, by being so independent. And now when you're independent, you have a whole new list of needs, romance, affection, understanding, compliments, empathy, <laughs> compassion, planning dates, helping out around the house, vacuuming, cleaning dishes, I mean, doing laundry, all these things that women are wanting us to do today. I never had to do that. I used to just go to my job. Now I got to go to my job and all that. Why? Because you chose as women, you want to go out and be independent. So you need more from us. And I'm teaching men, you can give women more. You just have to know the strategies to do it. So you don't feel burdened because men feel that burden too. Everybody's feeling burdened today only because they don't know how to do it. Once you know how to do something like, you know, the computer, Try changing softwares and <laughs> go from Apple to the other one and the other one. That one. It's just kind of like, oh, I have to relearn all of that. It's a burden, you know, it's, it's tough. You got to read the manuals. You got to learn the whole stuff. But once you get a handle on it, uh, it's pretty easy. Yeah. Yeah. Well, this wisdom, I mean, you've given us so much wisdom. And I think wisdom about relationships and having love and healing our hearts. I think some of the things you're talking about, not just today, but also in your Facebook lives and in some of your other work, which people can access on your website, marsvenus.com. I think it is so valuable for, for you to be offering so many tools and so many resources for us to obtain so much wisdom. And John, you're always so generous. I mean, you're just always so generous with what you share and so I just love connecting with you this way. And obviously my audience does too, because I think we have, I think we have like hundreds of questions now here pouring in. So maybe we can do it again another time. Um, because oh, I would just love to answer all these questions. These are so beautiful. I just I, one quick one, which is, you know, I'm a widow for two years. What do I do? Well, now I'm a widow of two years today. And what did I say? Date, don't wait. Please don't sit around being, you know, waiting, feeling alone. It, being alone is the enemy of femininity. Femininity is all about relationships, your friends, but also start dating again. But don't, don't think you're betraying your partner. And also don't feel like you can't be happy. This is a, a mind game that goes on. Our mind is, you know, we have a limited thinking unless we broaden it. If losing my wife caused such pain and loss and sadness, then if I no longer sad, that must mean I don't love her. Because the only reason I was so sad is because I love her so much. She's my life and she's not there. That makes me sad. So if I'm suddenly happy and in love and having a good time, that must mean that I didn't really love her. No, that means <laughs> it's just that sadness is this temporary experience we have while we're learning to let go but we don't never we don't stop loving them we stop expecting them to be there next to us in bed okay at home she's no longer going to be there in, in physical form so it doesn't mean i stopped loving her and it doesn't mean i can't be happy again but if we we feel like we're betraying our spouse if we're happy again and that's not true one, the simple thing is, of course, that if there's a heaven, they want us to be happy. But two, within our own self, we can love again and love again. And the way you can love again, if you're a woman, is you date not to find the right person, date to practice these new skills. That's the thing. It's all practice. It, you know what I learned as a, as a teacher when I was young, had a lot of anxiety and fear about all this, because you can see how people can take it the wrong way. And a friend told me, he said, you know, uh, Comedians have to face tough audiences all the time. So don't worry about it. Why? Because every, every show you give, if you're a comedian, is just a rehearsal until you get on the Johnny Carson show, which would be like the Oprah show or something today. It's like, who cares? It's just a little audience. So basically what we're doing in life is growing. Who cares? As long as you create someone safe and you're practicing these skills, don't be alone. Don't be alone. I like our phrase, date, don't wait. And statistically, women wait nine years if they get involved again. That's statistically. Wow. Men wait three years and they're already married. 
<laughs> and often women then feel like, what am I chopped meat? He just got married again. No, is that women are more, men are more in touch with their need for women than women are in touch with their need for men. Because we have this thing called sex drive, which is highly, highly important. And having sex opens a man's heart. But for a woman, she has to open her heart before she can feel her need for sex, generally speaking. So sex is a big motivator, evolutionary motivator. And for women, love is a major, major motivator, but not necessarily the love of a man if you don't trust men or you can't trust yourself in relationship to men. You see, that's the big thing for women is it's all about trusting. I picked this guy. I thought it was going to be, and this is where divorce happens. I picked this guy. I thought he was the right guy. He wasn't. I can't trust myself. And the only way you can trust yourself is to listen to this talk I gave today and recognize, oh, you can trust yourself because now you realize you created a mess just like he created the mess. You're responsible. And if you can learn what you did wrong, then you have confidence. Confidence and you can trust again that I can get in another relationship and it will be better. But don't jump into a serious relationship right away. Practice, practice, practice until you're on the Johnny Carson show. <laughs> Yeah, I like it. I like it. That's beautiful. So for the ladies that are listening here and are with us, I would love for you to put a little um, thank you to John for his generosity and sharing today and maybe share one thing with us that you're taking away from the conversation today, something that really stands out. And uh, John, I know you're probably trying to kind of peek at those too, but um, I also want to give you a chance, John, to also, um, and go ahead and take a minute to do that, but I also want to give you a chance to tell us a little bit more about your work and some of the things that you're doing right now. Oh, I love your comments, everybody. I just want you to know it's beautiful. And uh, so some of the things that we have available, um, MarsVenus.com over a hundred blogs that I've done on uh, video blogs, short video blogs on relationship. I've done uh, 32 different health blogs, uh, some supplements you can take in order to balance your hormones, uh, create libido, uh, better sleep, blood sugar balance, uh, releasing pain in the body, uh, a lot of easy things. You know, I just focus on the easy stuff, natural things you can do. And so I give you videos on that to be healthy. Uh, and the, the relationship skills are all there. My daughter, Lauren, she's 34. She does um, amazing blogs, probably about 50. I think she's got video blogs. Uh, join our mailing list. You get every week, you get a video of me as well, a video of Lauren. They come, they come and go. We've got an insiders club. We have access to 200 seminars that I've taught. Uh, you can pick and choose, but every week we give you one. Uh, we give you five to choose from, or you can use, watch them all if you have time. Uh, you know, we know we're all busy, but it's nice to be able to dip in there and get a little uh, reassurance and answer questions. And they tend to be timely. Uh, then there's my Facebook, which I've got right now. The uh, It's called John Gray Mars Venus Facebook site. And there, if you go to the videos, you'll see there's a, a, a lot of videos. I just finished doing the six weeks of every day doing two hours. So or sometimes longer on topics like... Um, how to meditate, difference between meditation for men versus women, um, uh, uh, communication skills and dating, um, healing the heart, success principles, sex and dating and romance. So those topics are all there. You can check that out, that's available. Uh, and I, I invite you to participate there as an insider, you get special deals and so forth. But also if you just want the free stuff, it's all there. I want to make this available to as many people as possible. And I feel really honored to be on this show. We really, really appreciate you, John, and are so grateful for your generosity and wisdom. Once again, it's always just such a pleasure and a delight to be with you. And, and really, really, I'm honored. Thank you again. It's, it's mutual. And I'm just so impressed with the comments that everybody's made and grateful for them. Uh, <laughs> Particularly after reading some of the comments on uh, Facebook Live, <laughs> it's random people. You know, I'm, I'm used to different audiences. So this is my audience. Thank you so much. Yeah, yeah. Well, this audience loves you for sure. That's, that's uh, definite. So thank you so much, everyone, for joining us. And uh, John, again, once again, we thank you. And uh, we wish you all the very best um, and in life and in love. 
and uh, are so grateful for all you're contributing to the world. I mean, your work, your work, your body of work, it's just, to me, it's got to be unfathomable to think about how widespread your work has reached into the far corners of the earth and how much of a difference you've made for so many people out there. That's just an amazing, beautiful gift that you brought to the world. Well, right now I'm working on a, right now I'm working on a book, Men Are From Mars For Women Only, and these questions are, are, will be highlighted in that book. So this is very good for research for me as well. So I'm looking forward to a copy of it and, and the comments that women have made. So helpful for me and trying to address the needs that are most current at all age groups. Thank you so much. I will um, compile the questions that are here in the chat in the Q&A and also the questions that we didn't have a chance to get to today so that you have that because we'd be honored as a group to be part of your book research. Thank you. I'm looking forward to it. I yeah, that. so I will email that to you, John. And thank you so much, um, everyone, for joining us. And we will be with you hopefully again. Bye-bye for now.